Okay, class. In this series of lectures, we'll cover our interventional cardiology and cardiac surgery. Again, you know, these aren't things that you'll necessarily be performing as a PT, but you'll be working with some patients who have sustained um, or received these procedures to treat uh, you know, cardiovascular disease of, of a variety of different types. So, um, you know, my goal by the end of this series of lectures is that you understand you know, what these procedures involve, and then really the physical therapy implications for these disease, especially status post cardiac surgery. And we'll get into why we, we mentioned that more specifically um, as well. All right, so in terms of myocardial infarction, just a little bit of a recap from our previous lectures in, on cardiovascular disease that there's an old saying in cardiology that time is muscle, really. So when we look at a myocardial infarction, when we first start having that, you know, you know, ischemia, necrosis process, you know, within the first 20 minutes, right? So if we have an occlusion that lasts less than 20 minutes, uh, you know, there won't be irreversible injury. But the longer that persists, we start getting into necrosis, right, and, and cell death. And it's important to remember when we look at the death of myocardial tissue, it occurs from the inside out. Now that has to do with a few things. One being that, you know, we'll, we'll show this in a later graph that we still have some perfusion from those primary or epicardial coronary arteries. Um, and then there's different you know, tissue pressure differences as we, we get further deep into the, we call the sub endocardium. So infarctions move from inside out. And then it follows this, this kind of typical process where when we lose blood flow, we've got a stunning of the myocardium. It doesn't move as much. It doesn't move. Uh, you can think of this almost as that rigor mortis, right? The, the stiffness of death. When we don't have perfusion and oxygen, we don't you know, continually resupply ATP. We can't, un, we can't break those myosin active chains, right? They're heavy chains. So we don't, you know, they're stuck in that contracted state. It's the same sort of thing happens in the muscle. That's what we call myocardial stunning. Um, but again, within 20 minutes, no death. We start going, you know, longer and longer. We move into irreversible injury and um, cell death. And then we get to, you know, beyond three hours, we can see what we call a transmural infarction, where we've got a full thickness, basically, uh, death of tissue. So the goal is really to try to get people within the uh, the cath lab, and we'll show you what that what that all entails, and stented, or at least open this up you know, within that really that first. Ideally, within the first 30 minutes, um, at most, you know, maybe really an hour to, to 90 minutes. So that's 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 the goal to get people in the cath lab. You may see this referred to as door to balloon time. That's when they open up the the, uh, the vessel, and uh, I think the AHA recommends you know, 90 minutes you know, is the absolute cutoff. So again, just remembering that when we have you know cell death, we see a spike in in troponins and a lot of other enzymes when the, the muscle begins to die. Again, we talked about there's different types, and we look at the, the breakdown in terms of you know clinical phenotypes. So you know, we think of ST elevation often, you know, in terms of changes on the ECG. We always confirm that with positive biomarkers. Now there can be some situations where we see no ST elevation, but there are still positive biomarkers, meaning they still had an MI, and we call that an NSTEMI or non-ST um, elevation MI. So again, maybe someone comes to your, you know emergency room with chest pain, you hook them up to a 12 lead to see what's going on here in terms of looking at those buddy leads we talk about when we see ischemia. Um, we see some ischemia, we do some blood draws, we see that they had some spikes in those troponins, um, and then we will you know, send them to the cath lab and have them opened up, uh, the vessels opened up, and then we'll, they'll explore, and we'll show you what that looks like in a bit. Now, I do want to talk about the different, different um, Enzyme that you'll see release again, uh, troponins are the ones that we typically look at. There are as well creatine kinase. Uh, so creatine kinase, we see that in multiple different areas. You can see, you know, obviously in the muscle. There's also, uh, you know, creatine kinase that's released from the brain, uh, so there, and, uh, and then there's creatine kinase that's just specific to the heart. So creatine kinase specific to the brain, we call it CKBB. Creatine kinase specific to skeletal muscle, creatine kinase or CKMM, and then cardiac muscle CKMB, and uh, so you may see that in the chart. That will also elevate. Um, but typically, when we look at 
the, uh, the cardiac muscle death, we're looking at troponins and cardiac specific troponins. You might see troponin C um, as the one you know, referenced in the chart. Um, these should never really be elevated. Uh, there can be other reasons for troponins to be elevated as well, even cardiac troponins, but in concert with other symptoms with a positive ECG, findings for ischemia or infarction, um, again, ST elevation, ST depression, you know, that would indicate, yeah, this person probably needs to be sent to the cath lab to have an angio, um, uh, angiogram. Uh, so again, uh, that wavefront phenomena, and we talked about how the when we have an infarction, it goes from inside out. So we call the subendocardium. So again, to give you a point of reference, this is our endocardium. So inside the heart, this is the tissue just you know, above that. Um, and then we have our epicardium here, where our coronary or primary coronary arteries um, run across. And then we have those perforating branches, which run perpendicular to it um, and perfuse the muscle. Now, remembering that why we see this area get infarction or lose blood supply first, because there still is some potential blood supply from these epicardial coronary arteries. And again, as we get deeper into tissue, you know, tissue pressure differences. So it gets a little bit harder sometimes to perfuse, perfuse these areas. We call them vulnerable areas. And especially in people with cardiovascular disease where they've lost that autoregulation. So when that you know, there's compression or that increased metabolic demand, we, you know, we already have problems with, with perfusion because those endothelium aren't super healthy. So um, that, again, all sets the stage for, you know, ischemia. We're not going to dive too deep into that. We've already covered that, but it's a little bit of a review of physiology. So um, the first thing that, you know, there are, uh, a common procedure that a patient will get is a percutaneous coronary intervention. It's what we think of when we think of stenting. Um, so uh, we call it angioplasty with stenting, and we'll kind of touch on the difference. So uh, angioplasty is, you know, inserting a balloon um, to open up the, the vessel. So we identify that there's a plaque in the vessel. Um, you know, we'll place a balloon, you know, our guide wire with a balloon, you know, through that area, and then we'll inflate it and push open the, uh, the area that's occluded. You know, if that stays, you know, patent, um, they may not, may, may not do anything. They may just do an angioplasty with the balloon. Uh, more often than not, though, they'll leave a little stent in place to keep that area open. Um, so it's a non-surgical procedure. Again, we use this balloon to inflate, open up the primary coronary artery uh, to restore blood flow. And then we leave a stent uh, in place to keep that vessel open. Now, there are two types of stents. There are bare metal stents and drug-eluting stents. Uh, Drug-eluting stents have different medications that prevent a little bit of plaque buildup. Because anytime we place a metal alloy, even though if it's super, you know, a medical grade, you know, quality um, alloy, um, there will be a risk for for clot aggregation, platelet aggregation, um, which can lead to, you know, worsening complications. Uh, so these drug-eluting stents prevent the buildup of, of clot. So we're seeing more and more of these utilized. Now, in terms of trying to identify where they're placed. Um, now, typically we'll do, in, in, again, that angiogram, the guide wire will be placed through the femoral artery. We're seeing some places even do radio artery as well, or, you know, non-femoral placements just because, you know, there's a risk there. So we're, you know, but femoral is probably the more common place you'll see in, in clinical practice. So just be mindful of that if you ever work with someone with a, we call it PCI or a stent, again, uh, they may have had a, an insertion through that femoral artery, so it's got to protect that. So uh, when they do that, again, first, they're going to get this angiogram where we're going to look at um, the, you know, it's basically an x-ray of the heart. Um, they'll introduce a radioactive dye, um, which will show up on a fluoroscope, which is kind of what this sort of is, this angiogram. I'll show you what it looks like in a bit, and we can see the, the blockage. So uh, here's an example of a normal angiogram. I'm not expecting you guys to know all the different angles. You know, there's the, you know, caudal and, and cranial views. Um, that's really super specific stuff, but uh, this gives us a way to, you know, look at different views of the heart. So we can orient the camera to look at different different parts of the coronary circulation. So there's an example of the normal right system here, um, and then we've got the different branches here, the posterior descending, again, in most people right down on it. And then we have the spider view, which looks down on the heart, so we can see the LAD, the circumflex as well. And then we've got our areocaudal view, which will show us the um, the you know the the, <clears throat> the LAD and the circumflex, and then the LMS would be the left main 
uh, system. Now, there's a, a YouTube link here for you guys to check out that shows you kind of what the uh, angiogram will look like. Um, so again, you know, what they'll do is inject this radioactive dye that will show perfusion, um, you know, blood throughout the heart. If there is a blockage, there'll be narrowing. And this will be a little bit harder to appreciate and you'll see this kind of drop off. So uh, I think it's best described in that video. So I'll, I'll let you guys check that out. We're not gonna, you know, again, it's not super important that you guys, you know, like, you know, you know, know all these different views, but I think that little, that little video is kind of neat. It shows you uh, kind of what we're looking at here you know, in terms of the, uh, the vessels being occluded and then being restored with a stent um, following the angiogram. Now, um, the, another treatment that you might see is an endorectomy. Um, this is a little rarer. We don't do these as much anymore, but someone has serious plaque buildup, um, often in the carotid or femoral arteries. Uh, what they will do is open up the artery, so, so surgically open it up and remove it. Um, so this is for like serious you know, clots or um, like if someone has a really large blood clot in, a, in, a, in an area uh, or um, a really big plaque buildup. Um, so a little rarer, but that's what that is, endorectomy, opening up the uh, artery and then removing um, the, the, those, the blockage there and then suturing it back up. Now, we'll cover quickly treatments for arrhythmias. So you might see some patients um, after cardiac surgery with a temporary epicardial pacer, remembering that after surgery or even sometimes after um, a stenting, the heart's going to be a little bit irritable. When the heart's irritable, it's prone to arrhythmias. Um, so this temporary pacer keeps the heart in, you know, in rhythm, um, and it's inserted usually through uh, the incision that they place when they have surgery. So if you see that there, just be mindful of that. Like, you know, again, this patient's having their heart pace, and we typically see this in cardiac surgery, again, just because the heart, when it's irritable, it's prone to arrhythmias, and this can be removed. Now, there are permanent pacemaker, uh, pacemakers, <clears throat> uh, which are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, these... You know, at some points used to be very noticeable. Now they're, you know, almost, you might not even notice them, right? They're, they're getting smaller and smaller. And again, the same function as the, same function as a temporary pacemaker, it's used to, you know, control the heart rate. Now this is for patients that have really dangerous arrhythmias that um, the heart is, again, you know, the conduction system is really unhealthy and, and it's not doing its job. So they need uh, an external device to keep the heart, you know, pumping in a coordinated fashion. Um, generally the recommendations for these are you want to make sure that, you know, the patient within the first couple of weeks, they're going to, they're going to limit the motion on the left side to let that, the sutures kind of sit in place. And, you know, they typically have, you know, an, an exercise range about 10% or the, their exercise range should be about 10% below the, the cutoff rate for the implanted device. So every, every patient is going to be a little bit different. So it's always important just to talk. Uh, to the patient, to the referring provider about, um, you know, what's going to be the, the safe range for them to exercise. Some of them adapt um, to, you know, exercise. Some of the older models uh, might might not be as responsive, so that the responses to exercise might be a little bit different. But um, again, you know, these are getting smaller and smaller, you know, and they're really used, to, again, to control patients you know, who, you know, have your, maybe your severe, you know, AV node blocks, so third, third degree or higher, or second degree AV node blocks, particularly your, your type twos. Now, there are uh, implantable cardioverter defibrillators. These are not the same thing as a pacemaker. These are designed for patients that are at, at risk for ventricular fibrillation or VTAC, um, or VTAC, a very prolonged, sustained VTAC. These detect whether the heart goes into one of these deadly arrhythmias using this little you know, guy here, or this little sensor. And what it does is it sends in shocks to re to defibrillate the heart, right? To put it back into rhythm. Some of them also have built in, or may, may, patients may also have concomitant pacemakers as well, but these are different. An ICD is not a pacemaker, right? It is designed to shock patients back in rhythm who are prone to VFib, notably, again, to you know, for anyone who's in v, ventricular fibrillation needs to be defibrillated, right? Um, so if they're at high risk, you know, they could go into it spontaneously. This device detects it and puts them back into rhythm. Uh, sometimes they'll often have a, a vest that they'll wear as well. You may see that um, in some patients, but uh, the implantable ones uh, would, be the, would be the ICD. So 
Um, that's all we have for interventional cardiology. Uh, the next we'll get into our cardiac surgeries, um, and which are you know, a little bit more invasive procedures to treat patients with uh, different cardiovascular diseases.